the worst thing they said that could happen to me that I might lose my nipple. You know, I had never had dreamed that you know you could get infect infections to that degree. You know, um, I, I'd never even heard of necrotizing fasciitis. I actually, when he left the room, I sort of left there and I thought, God, I'm dying. You know, I'm not going to get out of this place. And uh, for anyone that's been in that position, I tell you, that's one hell of a feeling. Like, I so remember the um, doctors coming to see us saying she's very sick. And he said, what do you mean by very sick? You know, very sick for me is I'm throwing up. And I didn't really realise very sick meant you may not make it. Group A Streptococcus, or Streptococcus pyogenes, is carried mostly asymptomatically within the general population. The bacteria normally live in people's throats and can spread in the community from person to person by close contact. Group A strep can also live on the skin, particularly where the skin is damaged by conditions such as eczema. Often, people will be carriers of the bacterium without knowing and without suffering any illness. But Group A strep can also cause a variety of infections, from the simple to the life-threatening. Well, they can cause a whole range of infections from simple surface infections like a sore throat or um, impetigo, which is a sticky skin infection, to much deeper infections of the skin, things like cellulitis, the notorious necrotizing fasciitis, and also bloodstream infections, we call that bacteremia, and infections after childbirth and so on, even pneumonia, and those latter infections can be life-threatening. The most severe infections caused by group A strep are the deeper or invasive infections. Once on the skin, breaks in the skin or lining of the throat can allow group A strep bacteria to penetrate the deeper parts of the body. Infection of the tissues causes disease such as cellulitis, purpural sepsis and necrotizing fasciitis. Necrotizing fasciitis is essentially a term to, that just means death of the fascial layer and that can be due to all sorts of bacteria. About 80% are due to mixed bacteria but the particularly severe ones that kill patients very quickly are the ones due to group A strep which constitutes about 20% of necrotizing fasciitis. So, when the bacteria enter the superficial layers, they can cause erysipelas. When the group A strep bacteria enter the deeper subcutaneous layers, they cause cellulitis. Penetration of the facial layers causes necrotizing fasciitis, while muscle penetration causes myositis. When group A strep bacteria enter the bloodstream, they cause bacteremia, which can lead to septicemia and toxic shock. Some strains of group A strep are more prevalent in the community and some are more associated with invasive disease than others. Since 2000, there seems to have been a national increase in some invasive strains of Group A strep. Group A streptococcus causes the rupture of red blood cells and as such is termed hemolytic. Alpha hemolytic strep, seen on the right, causes incomplete hemolysis and is often associated with dental plaque. Beta hemolytic strep causes complete hemolysis of the red blood cells as seen by the clear pattern produced on the plate on the left. In addition to causing hemolysis, Group A beta hemolytic streptococci also produce many toxins and enzymes that help to cause their septic effects in the body and aid their spread through the body tissues by degrading connective and soft tissues. Group A strep is a particularly potent bacterium. It produces lots of toxins. Uh, these are proteins made inside the cell and exported out, so they're called exotoxins. It produces, for example, one that we use uh, in hospital practice that dissolves clots in arteries. We use it to treat patients with heart attacks, and that's um, a compound called streptokinase. So that's just one of the many different toxins that it produces. And these toxins and enzymes help break down tissue, muscle tissue, um, connective tissue. The organism also makes a number of additional toxins that cause a very harmful inflammatory response and that includes certain um, uh, toxins called superantigens which can overstimulate our immune system and um, our response to those toxins may well cause our blood pressure to fall and cause the symptoms and signs we associate with severe shock. Bacteremia, bacteria in the bloodstream, if not overcome and ingested by circulating white blood cells, can lead to septicemia. Septicemia, the uncontrolled multiplication of bacteria in the blood, results in the massive production of toxins and intermediary substances, responsible for the explosion of septic shock, 
and circulatory collapse. Once the streptococci gain a hold of the tissues, doubling their numbers every 20 minutes, if they survive the polymorphs attack and for some reason the immune response is impaired, then the multiplication can outstrip the protective mechanisms. The result is the systemic spread of infection wherever the bacteria have reached in the body. The polymorphs are attacked by the streps because the streps produce leukotoxin, which punches holes in the cell membranes. This explains why there's often little pus formation in infected wounds and a watery serosanguous discharge is produced. The multiple problems caused by these invasive group A streptococcal infections means that they're very serious diseases with significant mortality. The mortality of invasive disease is estimated at between 15 to 25 percent. It's certainly 25 percent or thereabouts in developing countries where um, healthcare is not quite so ava easily available, but certainly in this country the mortality is between 15 and 20 percent. Now in situations where um, the invasive case is complicated by a condition such as toxic shock syndrome, um, then we're looking at a mortality of up to 60 percent even with um, advanced intensive care support. There are certain recognised risk factors for Group A strep infections. These include skin conditions such as eczema and minor skin trauma or chicken pox. The classic association for necrotizing fasciitis and Group A strep in children is varicella zoster, chicken pox infection, because the blisters are open vehicles, open ways for the bacteria from the throat to get in through the skin. and nearly all the cases of necrotizing fasciitis in children reported have been following chickenpox. There are further risk factors for group A strep infections. Group A strep infection at the time of childbirth can cause puerperal sepsis. Historically this was a common cause of death in labour and puerperal sepsis still occurs, sometimes causing death in mother and baby. The infection arising from vaginal colonization or post-surgical infection. But this bacterium does not discriminate and almost one-third of people presenting with an invasive Group A streptococcal infection have no risk factors. The big problem with Group A streptococcus infection is that it will, it's such an aggressive bug, it will hit the really fit, healthy individuals. Um, it hits athletes, so people who play rugby will think they've pulled a muscle and it's actually necrotizing fasciitis. It's no discriminator and you can't assume because somebody's otherwise looking quite fit they haven't got a very significant infection and particularly for the younger people their coping mechanisms are quite good and so they don't drop their blood pressure and they don't look that sick until very late on in the infection. Severe strap infections often give confusing clues at the outset of the infection presenting symptoms similar to other illnesses. The patient may have had a recent sore throat. In the case of bacteremia, the patient will present with a flu-like illness. Most of the early symptoms are due to the production of toxins by the bacteria. Some of these can induce vomiting and diarrhea, and some can induce a rash. Some of these toxins can also encourage the spread of bacteria through the bloodstream and tissues as the bacteria multiply. The patient might also feel pain in a localised area. The classical presentation to a general practitioner could be anything from flu through to deep venous thrombosis with pain and swelling of a leg or an arm um, through to gastroenteritis and that is why it's such a difficult diagno diagnosis to make because it presents in so many different ways. Ross was diagnosed um, with chickenpox on a Tuesday very simply, um, I tripped over a loose curb stone one evening uh, and sprained my ankle. It was something so simple and so silly. I worked at a preschool and I was rummaging in the car box for one of the children and cut my finger. I had a bad throat, my tonsils swelled up um, and they said I had quinsy when I went to the doctor. Um, I went into hospital to have a breast reduction operation. Um... Well, she started off with chickenpox. And, um, you know, we all go through chickenpox as children, so we all know how it develops. But she was different in, in terms of really one or two days later, she developed a very high fever. We rang the doctor. The doctor said, um, is there anything wrong with him? And I said, all I know is I've got a little two-year-old that is frothing at the mouth. He's um, unconscious as far as I was concerned. And he was fitting. And he's got chickenpox. I knew nothing more. So he said, well, if he doesn't improve in 20 minutes, give us another call. 
I had a high temperature, um, I felt sick, and I just, my whole body just felt um, really ill, um, but really, really down my leg, the, the very worst. I had c continuous vomiting, continuous diarrhoea, uh, and my urine output had started to slow down at that time as well. As time went on, she started to develop um, vomiting, got worse, diarrhoea, green diarrhoea, very lethargic. I felt very, very ill, similar to flu, but much, much worse. Um, and then my throat began to swell up. My skin went red, rather like a strawberry. Apparently that evening, I don't remember an awful lot after that, and that evening I developed full-blown flu symptoms, shivering, vomiting, diarrhoea, um, hot, cold, the lot, but the pain that just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it was always just getting worse, the fever, the, fever, the diarrhoea and the vomiting. And yet everything was, was just shrugged off as chicken pox. Then I started to look very flushed all over and itching. And they said I was allergic to the bed sheets. The important thing is the history. And so if somebody is unwell enough to present to you um, because of diarrhoea, vomiting, uh, gastroenteritis type illnesses, generally feeling unwell with aches and pains and flu-like symptoms, that might be all it is. But it's worth bearing in mind, could it be a streptococcal infection? And in those circumstances, I think the message is think strep. Just ask, has the patient been in contact with somebody with a severe sore throat? Have they had tonsillitis? Have they got anybody in the family who's got impetigo, skin diseases? Um, have they been having severe pains anywhere? They've been taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that might have masked the pain and might um, make them take longer to present to you. The whole constellation of the history taking should give you the big clue to the diagnosis. So it's, you can't take anything at face value. You have to ask the right questions. As the infection progresses, the early symptoms worsen and toxic shock-related symptoms start to appear. The patient will feel increasingly unwell and will become increasingly confused and neurologically impaired. Low blood pressure might result from septicemia. Symptoms attributable to the focus of infection can also arise or worsen, such as pain in a joint or muscle and a redness or discoloration of the skin in an area. In toxic shock, a generalised rash might appear, along with further symptoms. Well, toxic shock is characterised, I suppose by its name, by profound hypotension. Um, so a physician will notice that the fact that the patient is hypotensive. The patient will normally have a fast heart rate, but they may well have features of impaired organ perfusion. They may well not be able to um, converse properly because of hypoperfusion of the brain. They may, may well not tell the doctor that they have not passed urine for several hours but um, there may be evidence of um, diarrhea or vomiting, as we've discussed before. The patient may appear breathless. The paediatrician looks at her, and they try to take her blood pressure. And we only realised this afterwards. They connected up the blood pressure machine, and she said, oh, the machine doesn't work. And of course, we realised later that actually there was very little blood pressure. They had gloves on his hands, and they had socks on his feet. And I said, what have you got that for? They said, oh, he's getting a bit cold, yet his body was absolutely boiling. He still had a temperature of 104. Um, he was still fitting, but his hands and feet were freezing. And she went and started going delirious like this, her head waving around. And uh, we didn't know the significance of that. But then the resuscitation team was called, and we knew at that point she'd gone into multi-system failure, toxic shock. But up until the last second, till that happened, none of the, none of the medical profession had any idea how, how ill she was. When a patient presents with streptococcal toxic shock, you have to find the focus. If there is exquisite tenderness anywhere, then group A strep necrotizing fasciitis or myositis should be considered. In the case of necrotizing fasciitis, there's often a history of recent minor trauma, such as knocking a limb against furniture that later becomes the focus of the infection as the skin in the area becomes discoloured or bruised. The patient will also feel an excruciating pain in the area, one that is out of proportion to the physical signs presented. In the very late stages of the infection, the skin may blister. The major symptom is profound and severe pain in the early stages 
with little or no um, superficial skin involvement whatsoever. In the later stages, there may be um, discoloration of the skin. It could be erythema, it could be a grayness, it could be a purplish discoloration, followed by blistering in the very late stages. I developed a pain under my arm that just seemed to get worse and worse as the day went on. Well, I couldn't physically do a great deal because the ankle was causing so much pain. Um, the tablets didn't touch it and the swelling just continued to, to the point that my ankle became the same sort of dimensions as my knee. She took this dressing off and you could see a red rash and she was like, oh, this looks a bit weird and they had brought in another, a doctor to have a look and things like that and they said that I was allergic to the dressings. As the days went on uh, into the second day I had a, a large black blister came up on the outside of my um, right heel. There was a purple blister, quite a large one, and a couple trying to come up and then the rash had gone all the way across my stomach. So she had the swelling around the groin area and uh, it was quite pink swollen and then the one or two blisters started to appear, sort of blackish blisters. If a general practitioner or paramedic suspects an invasive group A strep infection, then the response should be swift. It's very important that patients are referred very promptly to hospital because in those situations, uh, investigation and management uh, in a timely fashion can be life-saving. Perhaps do a C-reactive protein if you can because a CRP is a very, very useful guide as to whether a patient has a bacterial infection or a viral infection. Viral infections do nothing to a CRP and it would be a, quite a quick way of differentiating between, for example, influenza and an acute bacterial infection. The later on in the infection, the infectious stage you are, the higher the C-reactive protein becomes. In a hospital setting, junior staff should seek advice from senior consultants as soon as they suspect a severe group A strep infection. If you've never seen necrotizing fasciitis or severe strep infections before, you won't know what you're dealing with and the early signs can be so subtle that you won't realise the tests to look for. And particularly with something like necrotizing fasciitis, the patient can be complaining of agonising pain, but there's not very much to see and it's the end of the bed nick factor that you only really get with experience and junior doctors won't have seen it before. In the hospital, the diagnosis needs to be confirmed. Blood cultures should be performed immediately and should be done regardless of whether the patient is hypothermic or hypotensive. A full blood count should be performed. A CRP is also vital and a microbiologist consulted if this is high and a CRP over 100 is an indication of a serious infection. A high creatinine kinase indicates myositis or toxic shock. With a suspected invasive group A streptococcal infection, the patient should be isolated immediately with full barrier nursing precautions implemented including masks for staff who are suctioning intubated patients. It is vitally important that as soon as bloods have been taken and resuscitation has been started, that antibiotics are administered immediately. It's a, an accepted um, trade-off in medicine that we take the simplest test for culture, which is a blood sample, and go straight in with antibiotics. And that's absolutely the case for all types of infections where we suspect septicemia, for example. You just can't afford to waste time with this infection. The doubling rate of these bacteria is roughly every 20 minutes, so millions and millions will develop over hours. And because group A strep is killing the white cells that should be dealing with them, the infection will rapidly increase. So the sooner you can get in with an antibiotic that kills the bacteria, the better. We tend to use a combination of antibiotics one that kills bacteria by breaking open the cell wall, so a penicillin type derivative, we use imipenem initially, and clindamycin we use because that gets into the cell and actually switches off the toxins. Thereafter, a team approach between the microbiologists, intensivists and surgeons are all key to a patient's survival. You need senior doctors involved at a very early stage and that means that you need consultant microbiologists consultant plastic surgeons and consultants in intensive care involved at, at a very early stage. It's, it's very rapidly fatal disease and, and so you need to involve senior people and you have to be very aggressive in your treatment. You have to, to get these patients to the intensive care and resuscitate them early and, and get them to theatre and, and involve you know, senior microbiology support and, and, and surgical support as fast as possible. 
Resuscitation should be started immediately. It's vital too that there's no delay in taking the patient to surgery in cases where the infection has permeated underlying tissues, such as in myositis, cellulitis or necrotizing fasciitis. From a surgical point of view, you need to get the patient to theatre as quickly as you can, ideally within four hours. And certainly if a patient has eaten or drunk anything recently, that would usually stop us from taking a patient to theatre quickly. But in the case of this infection, we would take them to theatre regardless of whether they'd eaten or drunk recently. When we take them to theatre, it, it doesn't mean that we, we, we uh, delay going to theatre because of resuscitation. We, we, we still take them to theatre and we carry on the resuscitation in theatre. So that means that we, once we get our, uh, our arterial line and our central lines in, we start our inotropic drugs. Uh, one of the other things that we quite often do is these patients go rapidly into renal failure and also that we know in patients with severe sepsis that if we um, remove a lot of the cytokines um, from their blood by using haemofiltration, this seems to improve outcome. And so with all these patients, we've, we've rapidly put them onto the haemofilter to help wash out all the cytokines out of their blood. And in fact, we've, we've started that quite often in theater and carried that on whilst the patient's having their operation. In surgery, the diagnosis can be confirmed by taking samples. The microbiologist has an important liaison role at this stage to ensure that correct specimens are sent for gram staining, culture and histological examination. Above all, the role of surgery is to debride the infected area of devitalised tissue. Usually a large debridement, um, it can be massive and it usually involves large amounts of soft tissue and subcutaneous fat and also some muscle often needs to be debrided. And it's important that a senior surgeon is involved so that enough tissue is removed for the patient to have all of their devitalised tissue removed at that first sitting. We tend to go back until we get to fresh bleeding edges of tissue um, and certainly when a patient is on the table, the amount of necrosis that occurs can spread on table as we're operating and the area to which you need to cut then has to increase. So you always warn a patient before they go to theatre that the debridement's going to be very extensive and you can't tell them at that stage how extensive it will be. At that point, it was clear that they had to get rid of skin tissue um, ahead of the infection to try and stop it spreading. So she then uh, underwent an operation that evening to remove all the flesh around the, flesh around the groin. And again, looking back on it, thankfully they, you know, they did a thorough job of re removing all the flesh. Because you, know, you understand later that's one of the big mistakes, is not removing enough. I had an open wound all the way from one hip to the other side, to the other hip. Then I also had, um, a, they'd tunneled underneath up into my armpit all the way up my, uh, my uh, right side. This professor, he just went for it big time and he left a, that huge crater in my chest. But, it, you know, if, if he hadn't have done that, I wouldn't be here. Once out of surgery, the patient must receive extensive intensive care support along with possible further surgical procedures. There are the general supportive things that we do. We give medicines to support the blood pressure. The patient will be sedated and will be on a ventilator to ensure they get adequate amounts of oxygen. Either in theatre or later started on the intensive care ward, these patients often require uh, kidney dialysis, which helps to take away a lot of the inflammatory mediators in the blood and is very likely to improve survival. We obviously continue with the antibiotics that they're on and we use immunoglobulin uh, in a dose of about two grams per kilogram and we've used it on quite a few patients and we've had no problems with anaphylaxis. Once the patients have been out of theatre for about 12 hours then we've got the opportunity to consider whether they'd be suitable for a relatively new drug called activated protein C which again has been shown to prove outcome in sepsis in adult patients. If you have toxic shock syndrome, it's absolutely mandatory in my opinion to use immunoglobulin. And we use immunoglobulin in large doses, two grams per kilogram, which again is somewhat different to a lot of centers, but we've not had any problems using that dosage. Antibiotic treatment must be continued with two antibiotics being used in combination. For the group A streptococcus, it is eminently sensitive to penicillin, so a penicillin-based drug, be it benzyl penicillin or a cephalosporin, is entirely appropriate. However, 
um, studies have shown that a combination of a penicillin with a drug like clindamycin, which can inhibit toxin synthesis and also reach the organism when it's in a protected environment, for example, hiding inside cells, uh, is of additional benefit. So we always use a beta-lactam antibiotic, like a penicillin, in combination with clindamycin, but never one of them alone. So historically, clindamycin was thought not to be a sensible antibiotic to use because it predisposed to Clostridium difficile diarrhoea. In Exeter, we've used clindamycin on thousands of patients, and we really have not had any significant problems with it. I think I had 20 times the normal dose of clindamycin, um, because as I say, there was nothing to lose, and because I was having so much fluid for my blood pressure, um, everything was being watered down, so just hit me with everything she'd got, and it worked. At the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital, Intensive education regarding the symptoms and signs of invasive group A streptococcal infections, along with a team approach of plastic surgeons, intensivists and microbiologists, has proved a successful strategy. This has been coupled with early aggressive surgery, resuscitation and the use of appropriate doses of antibiotics and immunoglobulins when necessary. The result has been a decrease in mortality rate from 46% to less than 6% in the last five years. Doctors do not realise how awful this bug is, they don't realise how it presents and they don't know what to look for. So education and early recognition and dealing with it is the most important thing. Such measures are vital because although rare, the results of these aggressive and rapidly invasive diseases can be devastating. They should really know how to recognise it because um, uh, after speaking to other victims of it since um, I've recovered, I mean, uh, nearly well, nine out of every ten, it's the doctors that doesn't recognise it in the first place. It makes it so horrific for the people in the end. I think with better education and to understand perhaps more about this, this infection, then something could have been done quicker. And who knows, I might have perhaps kept my leg. The trouble is with this bug, you don't have any luxury of time. From the first symptom that Ross really had of me knowing he was really poorly was when he had the fits. I mean, he was, a, he was grumpy, yeah, because he had chicken pox. But the first symptom came at one o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And at 5.30 the following morning, we're talking 14 hours later, he's dead. The problem with medicine is the statistics all say that 95% of things are fine. And I think that's fine if you were dealing with um, an inanimate object, a computer. If we produced 95% of computers that were fine and 95% were wrong, you could manage with that. But when it's, when it's people, that you don't want to be the wrong end of medical statistics. Even if 1% go wrong, if you're that person who's 1%, you know, that's a life that's devastated. If they can recognise it, they can save lives. And, you know, nobody wants to go through what I've been through. Not only does it destroy you, it destroys your whole life because you never expect to lose a child. You never ever expect to lose a child.